The challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Ben Pickens and his young wife, Judy, stood on the deck of the riverboat as it docked at Selkirk. They had their carpet bags beside them and were waiting impatiently for the gangplank to be put in place so that they might go ashore. Gosh, Judy, just think. By tomorrow, we ought to be settled in Beaverton in our own place. I know, Ben. I still can't get over our good fortune, having your grandfather, Ned Beaver, leave us everything he owned. Do you think we can take possession right away? I guess so. The letter from the lawyer said to come right to his office in Selkirk and that things would be settled promptly. Oh, crazy. As if I don't know every word of that letter by heart. It said we're heirs to a mine, a house and other buildings. <laughs> I remember that part. Hey, look, the gangplank's down. Oh. Let's get going, honey. Oh, boy, in a minute we'll be setting foot on the land where we'll never have to worry about money again. Come on. Let us through here, please. Pardon me, can I get through here? Lawyer Grant looked over the top of his glasses at the nice young couple who sat expectantly in front of his desk. His greeting had been congenial enough, but now he seemed hesitant to speak once his visitors were seated. Finally, he cleared his throat and spoke. <coughs> so you're Mr. and Mrs. Benjamin Pickens, eh? <laughs> sure we are. We already showed you the letter you sent, but if you need more proof... No, I... no, not at all, Ben. I'm perfectly satisfied as to your identity. Well, Mr. Grant, what... Well, what do we do now? Yes, we're anxious to get to Beaverton as soon as possible. Yes, of course, of course. But, uh... Is there something wrong? I mean, Ben's grandfather did name us as his heirs. Oh, yes, yes, he did, Mrs. Pickens. And what's the matter? You act as if you ben, had Ben, I realize when you walked in here that you must not have received my second letter to you. Well, second letter? Well, we only received the one Ben just showed you. That's too bad, too bad. You see... Uh, Mr. Beaver made his will a year ago and left it here with me. I went away for several months a while back, and when I returned, I found out your grandfather had died. I immediately wrote to you, then I went to Beaverton to look things over. Go on. Well, Beaverton is a small settlement named after your grandfather who found gold there and started his mining company. Is it far from here? Ten miles. Mr. Beaver built a three-room cabin for himself and built other cabins and a store. They were well to us, too? Yes, yes. But when I went up there right after I sent you a letter, I found the settlement deserted. Deserted? What? Yes. It seems the mine had given out. Oh. It took all the money Mr. Beaver had in the bank to pay off the men. The miners left and others who had gone up there hoping to find gold because the mine being there also pulled up stakes and went elsewhere. What you're trying to tell us is that we've inherited nothing but a deserted settlement, is that it? That's it, Ben. I see. I told you that in my second letter, but I suppose you'd already left for the Yukon by the time it arrived in the States. Yes, we packed up and left right away. Yes. It took almost all our money to get here. Gosh, I... Uh... I don't know what we'll do now. No use even going up there, seems to me. Ben, we came all this way dreaming about living in Beaverton. At least if we do go there, we'll have a roof over our heads until we know what to do. I'm sorry about all this. I'll make out the necessary papers for you to sign anyway. But though you practically own the whole settlement, there's no way to make a living in a deserted place like that. Golly, Judy, I... Ben, don't... we've got to make the best of things right now. I say let's go up to Beaverton anyway. But doggone it, Judy, we don't even have a way to get there. There were four horses left with your grandfather's property, Ben. 
They've been stabled at the livery stable here in Selkirk. Of course, there must be quite an amount due for their keep by now, but uh, you might make a deal to take two of them and let the other two go for the bill. At least that's something, Ben. Don't be discouraged, dear. We'll make out somehow. Well, all right. We'll stay here in town overnight, and we'll ride to Beaverton in the morning. <laughs> that night in the cafe in Selkirk, a rough-looking man stood just inside the door, glancing over the crowd. Then he headed for a table where a sharp-featured man sat alone. Hi, Greg. I thought I'd find you here. Well, what about it? Did you get the supplies at the trading post? I got the supplies all right. They're all packed and ready. But I heard something up the street you ought to know, Greg. What? Well, look, Sam, if you know something, let me hear it and stop hinting. Old man Beaver's grandson and his wife arrived in town today. What? And they're going to Beaverton in the morning to stay a while. Holy mackerel. I knew Beaver made a will leaving things to a grandson in the States. But I made it a point to talk to Beaver's lawyer a month ago. And he said he'd written to them, saying the place was deserted and not to come. Maybe. But they came just the same. And if they find out... Shut up, we... shut up. We're leaving for Beaverton right away. So by the time they get there, nothing will arouse their suspicions. But they intend to stay. What about that? You leave that to me. Let's get out of here. All right, I'm As the two men left the cafe and approached their horses at the hitch rack, Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police, who was walking by with his dog, Yukon King, stopped and spoke. Well, Greg Fisher... I thought you went to Whitehorse after the Beaverton mine closed. Aye, Sergeant, I, I did go to Whitehorse, but I decided to come back. Oh, you know Sam Macon, don't you? I've seen Sam around town. Yeah, I get to town now and then. I notice you have a pack horse loaded with supplies, Greg. You settled someplace? Yeah, Sam and I are working a claim up on Caribou Run. Oh, that's off the beaten path. I don't get up that way often. Let's see, as I recall, there are only a couple of claims up there, aren't there? That's right. But we decided to try our luck. Oh, you know, after being foreman of the Beaverton mine, it's sort of a letdown in a way. I suppose so, but you might make a strike. Then you'd be better off in the long run. Yeah, that's right. Oh, if you ever get up that way, drop in on us, Sergeant. Thanks, I'll do that. Well, King, we'd better be getting along. So oh, long. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good luck. Hey, what you want to say that for? Say what? To drop in on us if he gets up to Caribou Run. Don't be a sap. That's the best way to make him think everything's all right. Preston never gets up that way anyhow. Come on, let's get out of town. Oh, easy, sit it out, boy. Come on, get up there. After leaving Sam and Greg, Sergeant Preston went to the constable's office. Go on in, King. Well... Finished with your sightseeing tour, Sergeant? Yes, Jim. It's a nice night for walking. I wanted to see if there were any newcomers around town. <coughs> By the way, I uh, ran into that fellow, Greg Fisher, that used to be a foreman for old Ned Beaver. He was with a man named Sam Macon. I've seen both of them around town recently. I hear they've staked a claim somewhere not far from Selkirk. Fisher said it's on Caribou Run. That's about five or six miles from here. It seems strange that an old hand at the mining game like Greg Fisher would put in time on a claim up there. That's what I thought when he told me. That section was panned out long ago. Yes, I know. Frankly, I never liked either of those men, Sergeant. They're the ones the type I'd trust very far, Jim. Old Ned Beaver once told me the only reason he kept Greg Fisher on as foreman was because Greg was an old hand at mining and knew how to handle the tough men who worked under him. <laughs> He's quick-tempered and fast with a gun. I guess the men found that out. Well, he's managed to keep out of trouble, so far as we know. Oh, by the way, Sergeant, Ned Beaver's grandson, a young chap named Ben Pickens, arrived today with his wife, Judy, to claim their inheritance. Oh? Well, I thought Mr. Grant notified them there was no use coming here. Well, it seems Grant's second letter telling about what to expect got there too late. Anyway, they're here, and they intend to go to Beaverton tomorrow morning. To look the place over? From what Grant told me, they decided to live there for the time being. Oh. Well, since they're almost broke, I guess they don't know what else to do. I'll be headed that way day after tomorrow. I'll stop by and talk to them. It's only ten miles. 
I think I'll ride as far as Beaverton with you, Sergeant. I might as well get to know them in case they run into difficulty later on. Glad to have your company, Jim. We might even cut across and take a look at that claim Fisher and his friend Sam have staked out. Good. I'd like to see it. Well, I'm going to turn in. I'll see you at the cabin, Jim. Come along, Jane. The following day, Ben and Judy Pickens arrived in Beaverton. The summer's sun was warm. And as they rode along the deserted street toward the roomy log cabin they saw up ahead, they fell alone in a dead world. Judy was the first to laugh shakily and speak. Well, dear, at least we can say we're masters of all we survey. Frankly, the place gives me the willies. Now, Ben, maybe we'll have fun looking over the buildings we own, even if nobody will ever want to rent them from us. It doesn't take long for buildings to look beaten down, honey, in a deserted settlement. Oh, look there. That must have been the cafe. Yes. The building we just passed must be the main building of the mine. The sign is still across the front, though it's faded out a lot. Yeah. Well, there's the cabin where Granddad must have lived. It's the biggest one here. I hope people didn't take out all the furniture. Mr. Grant said there was enough to get along with. After we get settled there, we'll look around the mine building and the cafe. At least that'll give us something to do this afternoon. That afternoon, Ben and Judy looked over the building at the mine and even entered the dusty mine tunnels. Then they walked over to the cafe building nearby and entered... They saw a large main room where the cafe had been. There was a stairway up one wall to a narrow balcony above, off which several doors opened. Ben looked around and then said, Those doors up there must be to rooms that were rented out to travelers. This was a sort of cafe and hotel combined, I guess. Yes, I guess so. My things are sure dusty. Yeah, and quiet. I bet there used to be a lot of noise in here in the past, though. Oh, I can almost hear the miners when they came here at night to get... Ben, what was that? Uh, a door slammed shut. Oh, we left it open when we came in. Must be a draft. But there's no wind stirring outside. Of course, I suppose it could have been... Ben. What's the matter? All the doors up on the balcony were closed tightly when we looked up there a moment ago. Sure, I know. But why are you... Look, the one on the end. It's wide open now. Oh, Ben, I, I'm frightened. It's spooky. <laughs> Now, don't, don't be silly, honey. When the front door closed, it caused a movement of air that made that balcony door open. That balcony door slammed shut just now. Ben, let's get out of here quick. Hold on, honey. There's no use in getting panicky about this just because we don't understand what's going on. There must be some logical explanation. And I hate to leave without finding out what it is. But, but there's no one here, Ben. No one. They, they call a place like this a ghost town. Do you think it's any way possible oh, for... Oh, Judy, get control of your nerves, honey. You know as well as I do, there aren't such things as ghosts. But, but doors don't open and close by themselves. That's right, they don't. Oh, ben, I'm frightened. I wish we hadn't come here at all. Well, frankly, I'd feel a lot braver myself if I knew what we were actually up against. It's the mystery of it all that bothers me. <laughs> but remember, we own this town... And if spooks are living in this building, they'll have to pay us rent to do it or get out. Ben, it isn't funny. Let's get out of here and go over to the cabin we'll have to live in. In a few minutes, Judy. First, I'm going up on that balcony. And leave me down here alone? Oh, no, you aren't. If you go up there, I'm going along with you. After all, I... Ben, look. Now what? That door, the one that slammed shut, it's half open again. That settles it. I'm going up there right now. <gasps> ben... Then take me out of here, please. All right, honey, we'll go to the cabin. There's something funny about all this. And I'm not giving up until I find out what it is. Let's go. Ben and Judy left the deserted cafe building and went back to the cabin in which they were to live. I'd sure like to know what's going on over there. Look, Judy, there's a good view of the cafe building from this side window. We look over there once in a while, we might see something. What do you expect to see? Whoever's pulling all that crazy stuff over there might show himself. Then I'll know what we have to contend with. Ben, I don't know what to think. I'm almost afraid to stay here in this cabin tonight. Oh, don't be silly, honey. We'll clean it up, then you can cook supper. After that, I'll sort of keep my eye on that cafe. And if I do see anything, I'll go over. I have a gun, you know. Oh. Now stop worrying and let's get to work on this cabin. 
At dawn of the morning following Ben and Judy's odd experience in the deserted cafe, Sergeant Preston and the constable started from Selkirk on horseback, with King running alongside. Within the hour, they approached the cabin where Greg and Sam were supposed to be staying on Caribou Run. Do you think we'll really find them here, Sergeant? What makes you think they might not be here? I don't know. Just the thought I had that they might have been lying. I thought the same thing. That's why we came this way. Now, look. Smoke coming from the cabin chimney. I call you are right. They'll be surprised to see us. Yeah, I bet they will. Oh, like it, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, King. Sergeant Preston, the constable. Is there something wrong? Not that we know of, Sam. I'm just heading north on patrol. I remembered you were out here, so we dropped by. Going to ask us in? Right. Sure. Yeah, yeah, come on in. <laughs> I was just finishing breakfast. Where's Fisher? Oh, uh, oh yeah, Greg. Well, you see, he went out kind of early this morning. We didn't see him around. How far away is your claim, Sam? Oh, it's right out back. Greg went out to look around the vicinity, thinking we might find a place to uh, stake a second claim. Really? Then you must have found something to convince you there's gold up this way. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. Of course, we do all right. Just a little, but enough to urge us on. Uh, you want some coffee? No, thanks. We had breakfast. We'll move on now. Uh, where are you heading for, Sergeant? Well, eventually land in Dawson. Well, what I mean is, uh, well, are you going by Indian Creek Way? No, we're cutting across and going through Beaverton. To, to Beaverton? Yeah. Anything wrong in that, Sam? Why, no, no, of course not. I was just wondering why you go through that deserted place, that's all. I... Oh, just pass, Sue. Well, Jim, let's get moving. Come on, King. Oh, oh, oh. So long, Sam. Tell Greg we we're sorry we missed him. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll tell him you were here, all right. So long. The two Mounties rode leisurely with King trotting ahead. Finally, they drew rein in front of the cabin occupied by Ben and his wife. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Boy. Even as they stopped, the door flew open, and Judy appeared and raced down the steps toward them. Thank heaven you come. Something terrible has happened. Calm yourself, Mrs. Pickens. This is Sergeant Preston. Now, if there's trouble, I'm sure Let's we'll... Let's go inside for a few moments where we can talk. I... I'm sorry, Sergeant. Do come in. Now, Mrs. Pickens, sit down and try to tell us what's happened. Yes. It... It's Ben, my husband. It... He's gone. Tell us about it. Well, you see, we came up to Beaverton. Quickly, Judy told the Mounties about their arrival in Beaverton the day before and about the strange happenings at the deserted cafe. Preston listened intently, and then he asked, After the strange happenings at the cafe, you and your husband came back here to this cabin. Yes, we watched from the window on the side. You can see the cafe over there. Oh, yes. Go on. Well, we cleaned up this place and prepared supper. We didn't see anything at all when we looked out, just the awful empty streets. Ben wanted to go back to the cafe and look around, but... I was so nervous he decided not to. I see. Well, finally we turned in for the night. The summer nights are very short, as you know. Yes, yeah, just a few hours. During the darkest period, I woke up. At first, I didn't realize where I was. Then I sat up and glanced toward the side window. Ben was snoring there beside me. Ben! Ben, wake up! Wake up! Oh, what's the matter? Ben, look through the window at the cafe. Mm. I saw a light move, like a candle or lantern being carried past the downstairs window. Oh, you're all upset, honey. I don't know. Mean... There it is again. Holy smoke, I see it now. Something's going on over there. Wait, Ben. What are you going to do? Where are you going? I'm putting on my clothes and taking my gun. And I'm going over there and find out about that light. Ben, it's not there now. It's gone. Please, Ben, it's so ghostly. So... Nonsense, honey. Spooks don't need a light from all I've ever heard. There. Oh, Ben, I, I'm afraid. Please wait until morning. No. Now's the time to find out what's going on at that cafe. Oh, don't worry about me, honey. 
I have my gun, and they don't know I'm coming over there, whoever that is. But then I... Don't be nervous, Judy. I won't be long. After I find out what that's all about, we'll both feel better. You better lock this door after I leave. I'll tap three times when I come back. All right. We can't stay here any longer. We just can't. I'll tell Ben as soon as he gets back. What happened when Ben came back? What did he find out? That's just it, Sergeant. Ben didn't come back at all. Oh, I see. Well, maybe he's still trying no, to... No, he isn't anywhere at the cafe. At dawn, I finally got nerve enough to go over there. I became so frantic, I forgot my fear and ran all over the place shouting his name. I even went up and opened the doors off the balcony. But those rooms were all empty. Ben's gone. Great day. He couldn't just disappear into thin air. That's right, he couldn't and didn't. Well, Come on, we'll take King and go to that cafe. Oh, do you have something of Ben's, a hat or a glove? Yes, his hat. It's there on that peg, I'll get it. What do you make of it, Sergeant? I figured something out. It'll be up against two men at least, possibly more. But I don't see Here's how you... The hat. Oh, thanks. Wait here, Mrs. Piggins, and keep your door bolted, as Ben told you to do. As soon as we learn something, we'll let you know. Oh, Sergeant, do you think... Don't worry, I'm sure Ben's all right. Come along, King. <laughs> as the two Maltese left the cabin and walked slowly toward the deserted cafe, the constable asked, Sergeant, you act as if you have an idea of what's behind all this. Do you? Maybe, Jim. I'm not sure, of course. But I remember the circumstances of the Beaverton mine's closing. When the ore gave out in the main part of the mine, old Ned Beaver spent plenty in hopes of finding another vein. Yes, I remember. Greg Fisher was in charge of that. On the basis of his report that the mine was a total loss, Beaver gave up and the settlement became a ghost town. I know. Oh, uh... here's the cafe. Have your gun ready. Slowly, the two Mounties walked to the center of the main room of the cafe. Then Preston held out the hat and spoke in a low voice. Here, King. Find him, boy. <laughs> He's heading for the front door. Come on, Jim. Hey, I don't get it. King picked up the scent Ben left when he was in there yesterday with his wife. See? Yes. King started back to the cabin. Here, King. Not that way, fella. Find him. The intelligent dog sniffed the ground and then looked up at his master, trying to understand. Once more, he whined and sniffed, then started away from the cafe toward the mining building. He's found a new scent. Ben didn't get inside the cafe last night, I'd say. Then if we follow King... You we... stay here near the front window and keep your eyes open. You can see inside. Have your gun handy. All right. I'll follow King. I hope to get back soon. Great dog led his master around the building to the main tunnel behind. Preston moved cautiously as he approached the opening. Easy, King. Easy, boy. Suddenly, King growled. Then, with a snarl, started forward as a rough voice spoke out. I'll get you, you snooping Look out, King! As the man cried out and fell, Sergeant Preston ran forward behind King. The shot had crippled the man in the leg, making him helpless. And Preston found him lying just inside the tunnel entrance. I'll take that gun. Easy, King. Down, boy. Watch him. Sergeant Preston, with ready gun, moved slowly beyond the wounded man. Ben! Ben Pickens! As Preston stood listening, he heard a thudding sound a short distance from him, as if someone were pounding with his feet. As his eyes became used to the dim light inside, he saw a figure lying on the ground. Then he hurried forward. Oh, bound and gagged. I'll soon have you free. There, the gag's out. Thanks. They knocked me on the head and brought me here. Judy. She's she... all right. There. <sighs> What's it all about? I don't get it. I think I do. Here, take this gun and guard that man till we come back. All right. Come on, King. We have more work to do. <laughs> Sergeant Preston and King hurried back to the front of the cafe. The constable was still on guard. As Preston arrived, he asked eagerly, Did you find Ben? What was the shot? I found him. He's safe. I had to shoot the man guarding him to save King's life. I left Ben watching him. Who is the man? Never saw him before. I had the idea you expected to find either this Sam This isn't or... over yet. We'll go inside and King can go to work again. Come on, let's go. Here's a glove I picked up in the cabin on Caribou Run. Oh, whose is it? Either Greg's or Sam's. Doesn't matter. Here, King. <laughs> Quiet, fella. Find him, King. <laughs> He's going into the back room where the office used to be. Yes. Trap door in the floor, see there? 
Shall we take a chance and open it? As the two Monty's stooped down and stared at the trap door, a voice from the doorway behind them spoke out. Well, Sergeant, what why the... don't you and the constables pull it open? Who's that? Fisher and Sam in the doorway. I warn you, keep that mutt back or we'll flash through him too. King, quiet boy. Well, Greg, you tricked us. You must have another entrance. Oh, for sure. We got an air shaft dug outside at the back with a wooden ladder right to one of the rooms upstairs. I got here ahead of you by a shortcut and warn Greg. Go ahead and open the trap door. And you'll both have a place to fall when we let loose with the bullets. <laughs> you snooping mollies will lie dead with gold all around you. I guessed as much. You found the vein but made a false report. Smart, don't you think? Now drop those guns and open the trap door. You drop your gun. What? Flash, both of you. It's Pickens. I'll get him. No, you don't. Oh! You won't get me. I'll Look out, Sergeant. I'll stop him. Oh, my leg. You're all right, Sergeant. Yes, Ben. How'd you get here? I had tied the other one just to be safe. And from over there, I saw these two climb from the air shaft and up an outside ladder. I decided I'd better run over here just in case. So I sneaked in, and you know the rest. Ben! Oh, Ben, I heard shooting, and I couldn't stay away any longer. I'm all right, Judy, thanks to the surgeon and his dog. You'll both be all right from now on. There's a vein of gold under this cafe, and it belongs to you. Oh. Oh, ben. Sergeant, what made you suspect Greg? There's no gold at Caribou Run, Jim. I knew that. I figured that was a stall to cover something else. What's more, this morning I noticed Sam Megan was upset and nervous when I mentioned Beaverton and asked for Greg Fisher. When we came over here, Constable, I was prepared for trouble. Gosh, you sure put two and two together. <laughs> he sure brought us two together anyhow. Oh, honey, I bet from now on this won't be a deserted settlement. That's right, Ben. When the news gets out, people will rush here to stake claims and rent buildings. You and Judy will have all the money you'll need from now on. Oh, it's wonderful. And I thought the place was full of spooks. Spooks created by Greg and the other two. Fisher, I arrest you and your two followers for attempted murder in the name of the Crown. Good luck to you and Judy, Ben. This case is closed. <laughs> We now take you to Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters in Dawson. You want to see me, Inspector? Uh, yes, Sergeant Preston. A vicious gang is operating around Whitehorse. I read the reports that have been coming in, sir. There's a description of a Dave Fillmore who's the leader of the gang. That's right. He and his men are killers. I know it's a very dangerous assignment for you, Sergeant. But I want you to go down that way and try to bring that gang in. Very well, sir. I'll leave with King this afternoon. Come on, King. <coughs> the Fillmore gang is known to stop at nothing. It may be that when Sergeant Preston and the great dog Yukon King do find the gang's trail, they'll be heading right into a death trap. Be sure to listen to this next exciting adventure, A Change of Mind. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you once each week until September, when we shall resume our regular Monday, Wednesday, and Friday broadcasts. <laughs> This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next broadcast. This is the Mutual Broadcasting Systems.